Hi, hello, and welcome to The Word. In our last study, I told you that our next study will be on the book of Enoch. If you're a Christian, I'm sure that at some point, you must have heard of different books that were not in the Protestant Bible, and that they must be shunned because they are devilish. Is this the approach we must take? Will these books have an effect on your faith and salvation? Today, we will explore this said book. Ready to study? Let's get started. Our understanding is that the early Jews were responsible for keeping all the words of God through the prophets and all the history of the kings and the pedigrees of all the families and priests, so that there would be nothing lost. But unfortunately, many writings were lost, and lots of information was lost. We know that Enoch lived very early after creation. If there is a book called the Book of Enoch, it means that he wrote it. But is this the case? If it were, then the Book of Enoch has to predate many Old Testament scrolls. It would have to be written before Noah, and it would have to survive the flood. So it would have had to have been preserved by Noah and his sons. It would have to survive Abraham, Moses, Babylonian captivity. It has a past Malachi, survived the intertestamental period, survived the time of Jesus, the New Testament, then after his death. It would have to survive through the time of Paul and down through the time of the early church. So the question is, who was Enoch to begin with? Well, let's go to Genesis to find out. But before we do so, let us pray. Gracious Father, we have come. We have come because we need to know. We hear things and we are confused by them because so many little pieces here and there are given without any direction or connection. Please help us today to find what we are looking for and may we be the wiser for it. Bless us now, we pray, for we ask it in no other name but the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So let us trace Enoch and then his book. As we said, to find out about Enoch, we have to go to Genesis. Genesis 4 and 5 to begin with. From Genesis 4, we read in verse 17, Cain had sexual relations with his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Then Cain founded a city which he named Enoch after his son. Enoch had a son named Erad. Erad became the father of Mehuhahel. Mehuhahel became the father of Methushahel. Methushahel became the father of Lamech. Is this the Enoch we are looking for? The one whom God took to heaven? His father was Cain? Let's try Genesis 5. Verse 1. This is the written account of the descendants of Adam when God created human beings. He made them to be like himself. He created them male and female, and he blessed them and called them human. When Adam was 130 years old, he became the father of a son who was just like him in his very image. He named his son Seth. You can read the rest on your own, but let us advance to verse 18. When Jared was 162 years old, he became the father of Enoch. After the birth of Enoch, Jared lived another 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Jared lived 960 years, and then he died. When Enoch was 65 years old, he became the father of Methuselah. After the birth of Methuselah, Enoch lived in close fellowship with God for another 300 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Enoch lived 365 years, walking in close fellowship with God. Then one day, he disappeared because God took him. So in chapter 4, Cain is the father of someone named Enoch. And in chapter 5, Jared was the father of someone named Enoch. So which Enoch are we referring to? Chapter 5's Enoch said, and God took him. So this is the one we are focusing on. If you notice from these accounts, everyone died. But Enoch did not face death because he disappeared. And his disappearance was that God took him to heaven. We were also told that he lived a godly life for about 300 years. Now, that's the only information we have from Genesis. So how would we know that Enoch actually wrote a book? Let's see if we can find 
some more information on Enoch. Our next stop is Luke 3, 37. Lamech was the son of Methuselah. Methuselah was the son of Enoch. Enoch was the son of Jared. Jared was the son of Mahalalel. Mahalalel was the son of Kenan. Well, here Luke was just quoting the genealogy that Jared was the father of Enoch. So nothing significant for what we are looking for. But we know that Luke had the right information from Genesis. There are two other mentions of Enoch in the New Testament, or maybe three. Hebrews 11, verse 5. It was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. For before he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God. So here Hebrews is repeating what was told to us in Genesis. So we can see the relationship between the two. We also have Jude 1. This time we are not just reading about him, but Jude is going to quote from him. Let us read very attentively. Verse 1. This letter is from Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. I am writing to all who have been called by God the Father, who loves you and keeps you safe in the care of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more mercy, peace, and love. Dear friends, I had been eagerly planning to write to you about the salvation we all share, but now I find that I must write about something else, urging you to defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all time to his holy people. I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. The condemnation of such people was recorded long ago, for they have denied our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So here, Jude tells us why he is writing to his brothers and sisters and friends. Now remember, the gospel is simple, that Jesus is the Messiah and we must live godly lives. But some have come in to tell them that they can live immoral lives and still be in Jesus. Can you imagine that? Jude is now trying to explain how wrong that is and how these people were prophesied about long ago. By whom? Verse 5. So I want to remind you, though you already know these things, that Jesus first rescued the nation of Israel from Egypt, but later he destroyed those who did not remain faithful. And I remind you of the angels who did not stay within the limits of authority God gave them, but left the place where they belonged. God has kept them securely chained in prisons of darkness, waiting for the great day of judgment. And don't forget Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighboring towns, which were filled with immorality and every kind of sexual perversion. Those cities were destroyed by fire and serve as a warning of the eternal fire of God's judgment. Okay, so he's saying that what he is about to say, they knew already. So this was common knowledge to the Jews that some angels did not remain in their domain. But having stepped out, God has them in chains of darkness until their judgment. Let's check the Greek to be sure what it says. It says the angels, both not having kept own their domain, but having left the own dwelling unto the judgment of the great day in chains under darkness he keeps. I'll use the new KJV for the English translation. And it reads, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. The question is, is that a statement referring to all the fallen angels or is that a special set of angels? We will have to explore that statement because if all the angels are securely chained in prisons of darkness waiting for the great day of judgment, then it means that there are no angels to tempt us, no demons to tempt us. But if these angels are the ones in chains, then it means something specific has happened for you to link them to immorality like Sodom and Gomorrah and talking about their particular imprisonment. The language is, did not remain in their domain. Verse 8, in the same way these people who claim authority from their dreams live immoral lives, defy authority, and scoff at supernatural beings. But even Michael, one of the mightiest of the angels, or it simply says Michael, the archangel, did not dare accuse the devil of blasphemy, but simply said, the Lord rebuke you. 
This took place when Michael was arguing with the devil about Moses' body. But these people scoff at the things they do not understand, like unthinkable animals, they do whatever their instincts tell them, and so they bring about their own destruction. What sorrow awaits them, for they follow in the footsteps of Cain, who killed his brother. Like Balaam, they deceive people for money, and like Korah, they perish in their rebellion. So he's comparing these people with the angels who step out of their domain, and he's saying they were immoral just like the angels. That's what in the same way means. From verse 14 is the main part linking to Enoch. Enoch, who lived in the seventh generation after Adam, prophesied about these people. He said, listen, the Lord is coming with countless thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on the people of the world. He will convict every person of all the ungodly things they have done and for all the insults the ungodly sinners have spoken against him. That's God. Let us dissect. Jude said he was the brother of James. So we have no problems with that. So he lived around the time of Jesus. He spoke about Enoch who lived in the seventh generation after Adam. We know exactly which Enoch he's talking about, the one whom God took. Now this is where we have to analyze things carefully because this can throw us in or out of a spin. So if he said that Enoch prophesied about these people since back then, that prophecy of Enoch would have had to exist long, long, long before Abraham and Moses, meaning before the flood. And if it did survive, it would have had to be preserved through the ark. He quoted from the book. He was not just repeating something he was told. He quoted from something that was written. Let me read that quote to you, Enoch 1, verse 9. And behold, he cometh with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all, and to destroy all the ungodly, and to convict all flesh of all the works of the ungodliness which they have ungodly committed, and of all the hard things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Exact quote. Direct quote, my gentle people. So how do we reconcile that? If we condemn the book of Enoch, then we would have to condemn Jude for quoting from it. He quoted in context of prophecy, not history. He was not giving us accounts of the Maccabeans like in the book of Maccabees. He was quoting a prophecy that was prophesied very long ago. The only other rational is if it is not from Enoch, it is from the intertestamental period when writers used to write books and put names on them that the people were familiar with to give them credence. If such is the case, then it was lost to the early believers because they are not found in the Catholic or Eastern Orthodox Bibles. The name for these books is the Apocrypha. And Wikipedia says the biblical Apocrypha from ancient Greek is hidden. It denotes the collection of apocryphal ancient books thought to have been written sometime between 200 BC and 100 AD. It was in Luther's Bible of 1534 that the Apocrypha was first published as a separate intertestamental section. So all the time it was together. The preface to the Apocrypha in the Geneva Bible claimed that while these books were not received by a common consent to be read and expounded publicly in the church and did not serve to prove any point of Christian religion save in so much as they had the consent of the other scriptures called canonical to confirm the same, nonetheless, as books proceeding from godly men, godly men, they were received to be read for the advancement and furtherance of the knowledge of history and for the instruction of godly manners. So what are we learning here? That by way of consent, there were lots of scrolls. Let me use the proper term because books did not exist back then. And Christians decided to compile them into what they call the Bible. Some they considered worthy of being in the compilation and others they thought were spiritual but not worthy. They then decided that those we compiled are holy, hence the Bible is holy. However, some had 80 books while others had 73. Finally, the Protestants took away all the others and settled for 66. Then everyone condemns the other for God's Bible being contaminated with devilish books. That's what Christians believe right now. But my gentle people, 
God did not send down any book called the Bible to earth. If he did, then which one is the true Bible? God spoke through holy men and they spoke or wrote. For many of the scrolls, we assume they were written by this and that person, but most times they themselves said they wrote. We are happy to have received them. We should be free to read and determine for ourselves if this or that sounds worthy. But we should not just condemn this and that to do what? Preserve our salvation. So if you are one who thinks this Bible is the word of God and that other Bible is not the word of God, relax and understand that all Bibles are a compilation of many scrolls and they exist because of consent. The Protestants did not think that Daniel nor the Revelation should be in the Bible. They were treated just like the Apocrypha books, but later added. Had this not happened, you would have condemned these books and never want to read them or read from them. So let's be more open-minded. Our salvation is in Jesus, not in a scroll that we read. Let me show you a list of the Apocrypha books, but you will not see the book of Enoch. If you pause and go through it, you will see all the books that are accepted across the board by all these early denominations. Enoch is not found. Well, it was said that only the Ethiopians had a Bible with the book of Enoch in it and was considered a no-no for Christians to read. It was finally dubbed an evil book and should not be read. However, the book of Enoch was found amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls, just like some of the ancient biblical books, which began to give it credence that it was in existence long before the Apocrypha books. So we have to read from it. We read the quote from Jude and it did not sound crazy. But before we do that, let us go to Genesis 6. Then the people began to multiply on the earth, and daughters were born to them. The sons of God saw the beautiful women and took any they wanted as their wives. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not put up with humans for such a long time, for they are only mortal flesh. In the future, their normal lifespan will be no more than 120 years. In those days and for some time after, giant Nephilites lived on the earth for whenever the sons of God had intercourse with women, they gave birth to children who became the heroes and famous warriors of ancient times. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. And the Lord said, I will wipe this human race I have created from the face of the earth. Yes, and I will destroy every living thing, all the people, the large animals, the small animals that scurry along the ground, and even the birds of the sky. I am sorry I ever made them. But Noah found favor with the Lord. Let's go over this passage that has brought much controversy for many years. But today, some of you will or may see something that you have never seen before, then you will have to make a decision as to what you will believe. So in Genesis, we are told of the world living very evil lives, but we were given a preamble that giants lived in the land because they were the offspring of the sons of God and daughters of men. The question has always been, who are the sons of God? It sounds sacrilegious to conclude that the sons of God are angels, even though in other places, like in Job, the sons of God are spiritual beings or angels. What's the alternative to angels? One view says that the sons of God are descendants of Seth, and in this interpretation, Seth's godly descendants were intoxicated by the beauty of women descended from Cain, thus marrying those who'd rejected God and leading to greater wickedness, and they used Genesis 4-5 to to support. But think about it. Men, mankind, people started multiplying on the earth and their daughters attracted the sons of God. There is a distinct language of people and those being attracted. So if sons of God are descendants of Seth, then they are of a special breed. This does not fit the passage, if you are to be honest to yourself. Since there are only two views and this view cannot stand, then we have to conclude that angels really had sex with women on earth and their offsprings became giants. What other explanation is there? Because they were spiritual? It's just that it's hard to conceive that angels can actually have sex with humans and impregnate them. But that is what the passage is saying. 
sons of God, who are angels, had sex with women and brought more corruption on the earth. But there is still one more stop before we go to Enoch that needs to be explored, which will support both Jude and Genesis. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But there were also false prophets in Israel, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will cleverly teach destructive heresies and even deny the master who bought them. In this way, they will bring sudden destruction on themselves. Many will follow their evil teaching and shameful immorality. And because of these teachers, the way of truth will be slandered. In their greed, they will make up clever lies to get hold of your money, but God condemned them long ago, and their destruction will not be delayed. He's going down the same line as Jude, immorality and condemnation long ago. Verse 4, for God did not spare even the angels who sinned. He threw them into hell in gloomy pits of darkness where they are being held until the day of judgment. And God did not spare the ancient world except for Noah and the seven others in his family. Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment. So God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people with a vast flood. Later, God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and turned them into heaps of ashes. He made them an example of what will happen to ungodly people. They're singing from the same hymn sheet. They both talked about angels when referring to immorality and tied it to the immorality of Sodom. And, and they both said that they are held in chains of darkness until that their final judgment. So there has to be truth to these angels who were forbidden to do this, but obviously would have had to manifest as humans to do such immoral things. So both Jude and Peter spoke of a knowledge that was known to the Jews that some angels messed up immorally and God dealt with it. And he also dealt with humans who did the same. This is supported by information in the book of Enoch. So let's go to the book. Enoch chapter 1. The words of the blessing of Enoch, wherewith he blessed the elect and righteous, who will be living in the day of tribulation, when all the wicked and godless are to be removed. And he took up his parable and said, Enoch, a righteous man, whose eyes were opened by God, saw the vision of the Holy One in the heavens, which the angels showed me. And from them I heard everything, and from them I understood as I saw, but not for this generation, but for a remote one which is for to come. Concerning the elect, I said, and took up my parable concerning them, the holy great one will come forth from his dwelling, and the eternal God will tread upon the earth, even on Mount Sinai, and appear from his camp, and appear in the strength of his might from the heaven of heavens. And all shall be smitten with fear, and the watchers shall quake, and great fear and trembling shall seize them unto the ends of the earth. Does that sound devilish to you? Not to me. It is the same chapter that Jude quoted from. If you condemn this, then you would have to condemn Jude. Just being practical. What is interesting is that it says that the information was not for then, but for a time far into the future. Let's go to chapter 6. Verse 1, And it came to pass, when the children of men had multiplied, that in those days were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters, and the angels, the children of the heaven, saw and lusted after them and said to one another, Come, let us choose as wives from among the children of men and beget as children. And Semiaza, who was their leader, said unto them, I fear he will not and indeed agree to do this deed, and I alone shall have to pay the penalty of a great sin. And they all answered him and said, Let us all swear an oath and all bind ourselves by mutual imprecations, not to abandon this plan, but to do this thing. Then swear they all together and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it. And they were in all 200 who descended in the days of Jared on the summit of Mount Hermon. And they called it Mount Hermon because they had sworn and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it. And these are the names of the leaders. Sam Lazaz, their leader, Arkil Kalba, Ramiel, Kokabel, and so forth. These are the chiefs of ten. So isn't this the same thing you read in Genesis with just more detail? If you condemn this, you should condemn Genesis. Did a writer in the intertestamental period took what is in Genesis, elaborate on it with his imagination? 
Did the devil do this to confuse people? Did Moses write about something that actually happened or something that did not happen? Did Enoch actually witness these things? Angels taking on wives knowing it was forbidden? This here just fits like a puzzle. Here is a word you should know, an L. An L is a Northwestern European unit of measurement, originally understood as a cubit, the, the combined length of the forearm and extended hand. The word literally means arm and survives in the modern English word elbow, arm bend. We go to chapter 7. And all the others together with them took unto themselves wives, and each chose for himself one. And they began to go in unto them and to defile themselves with them. And they taught them charms and enchantments and the cutting of roots and made them acquainted with plants. And they became pregnant and they bare great giants whose height was 3,000 L's, who consumed all the acquisitions of men. And when men could no longer sustain them, the giants turned against them and devoured mankind. And they began to sin against birds and beasts and reptiles and fish and to devour one another's flesh and drink the blood. Then the earth laid accusation against the lawless ones. Hmm, 3,000 cubits tall? Now that puts some serious perspective to how tall they were. This is scary just to imagine, but with that hybrid of demonic spirit and humans, the earth got more corrupted. The drinking blood and eating humans sounds so fictitious, but also gruesome. But the fallen angels were now teaching men things they should not have known, hence the further corruption. It is all making sense. Let's keep on reading. Chapter 8. And Azazel taught men to make swords and knives and shields and breastplate and made known to them the metals of the earth and the art of working them, and bracelets, and ornaments, and the use of antimony, and the beautifying of the eyelids, and all kinds of costly stones, and all coloring tinctures, and there arose much godlessness, and they committed fornication, and they were led astray, and became corrupt in all their ways. Semyaza taught enchantments, and root cuttings, Armaros, the resolving of enchantments, Barakiyal taught astrology, Kokabel, the constellation, Ezekiel, the knowledge of the clouds, Arakiel, the signs of the earth, Shamsiel, the signs of the sun, and Sariel, the course of the moon. And as men perished, they cried, and their cry went up to heaven. So in essence, they taught them war and how to decorate themselves and use metals and stones to create chains and earrings and face paintings, and you name it, they did. So obviously, they corrupted the earth. This is what Jude and Peter was saying God had to deal with these angels as well as the people and later Sodom and Gomorrah for their blatant degradation. There is still more. Chapter 9. And then Michael, Uriel, Raphael, and Gabriel looked down from heaven and saw much blood being shed upon the earth and all lawlessness being wrought upon the earth. And they said one to another, the earth made without inhabitant cries, the voice of their cries up to the gates of heaven. And now to you, the holy ones of heaven, the souls of men make their suit, saying, Bring our cause before the Most High. And they said to the Lord of the ages, Lord of lords, God of gods, King of kings, and God of the ages, the throne of thy glory standeth unto all the generations of the ages and thy name holy and glorious and blessed unto all the ages thou hast made all things and power over all things hast thou and all things are naked and open in thy sight and thou seest all things and nothing can hide itself from thee thou seest what azazel have done who have taught all unrighteousness on earth and revealed the eternal secrets which were preserved in heaven which men were striving to learn and Semyaza, to whom thou hast given authority to bear rule over his associates. And they have gone to the daughters of men upon the earth and have slept with the women and have defiled themselves and revealed to them all kinds of sins. And the women have borne giants and the whole earth has thereby been filled with blood and unrighteousness. And now behold, the souls of those who have died are crying and making their suit to the gates of heaven. And their lamentations 
have ascended and cannot cease because of the lawless deeds which are wrought on the earth. So now the unfallen angels, Michael, appeals to God to something, to do something. Even if he sees all and knows all, they still plead to him to do something. They must cry to God to save the world because of their other angels who have married humans. Chapter 10. Then said the Most High, the Holy and Great One spake, and sent Uriel to the son of Lamech, and said to him, Go to Noah and tell him in my name, Hide thyself, and reveal to him the end that is approaching, that the whole earth will be destroyed, and a deluge is about to come upon the whole earth, and will destroy all that is on it. And now instruct him that he may escape, and his seed may be preserved for all the generations of the world. And again the Lord said to Raphael, Bind Azazel hand and foot, and cast him into the darkness, and make an opening in the desert which is in Dudael, and cast him therein, and place upon him rough and ragged rocks, and cover him with darkness, and let him abide there forever, and cover his face, that he may not see light. And on the day of the great judgment, he shall be cast into the fire, and heal the earth which the angels have corrupted and proclaimed, the healing of the earth, that they may heal the plague, and that all the children of men may not perish through all the secret things that the watchers have disclosed and have taught their sons, and the whole earth has been corrupted through the works that were taught by Azazel, to him ascribed all sin. And to Gabriel, and to Gabriel said the Lord, Proceed against the bastards and the reprobates, and against the children of fornication, and destroy the children of fornication and the children of the watchers from amongst men, and cause them to go forth, send them one against the other, that they may destroy each other in battle. For length of days shall not they not have, and no request that they and their father, that is their fathers, make of thee shall be granted unto their fathers on their behalf, or they hope to live an eternal life, and that each one of them will live five hundred years. And the Lord said unto Michael, Go bind Semyaza and his associates who have united themselves with women so as to have defiled themselves with them in all their uncleanness. And when their sons have slain one another and they have seen the destruction of their beloved ones, bind them fast for 70 generations in the valleys of the earth till the day of their judgment and of their consummation, till the judgment that is forever and ever is consummated. Now, if you have a problem with that conversation with God and Michael and Uriel, and you say to yourself, that could never be, how would they know that? Just remember, you accepted that same conversation in Job with God asking the devil where he came from and the discussion that ensued. It's the same principle. If you reject one, you should reject all. Chapter 12. Before these things, Enoch was hidden, and no one of the children of men knew where he was hidden and where he abode, and what had become of him and his activities, and to do with the watchers, and his days were with the holy ones. And I, Enoch, was blessing the Lord of majesty and the king of the ages. And lo, the watchers called me, Enoch, the scribe, and said to me, Enoch, thou scribe of righteousness, go declare to the watchers of the heavens who have left the high heaven the holy eternal place, and have defiled themselves with women, and have done as the children of earth do, and have taken unto themselves wives. Ye have wrought great destruction on the earth, and he shall have no peace nor forgiveness of sin. And inasmuch as they delight themselves in their children, the murder of their beloved ones shall they see. And over the destruction of their children shall they lament and shall make supplication unto eternity, but mercy and peace shall he not attain. So Enoch was called to be a mediator between God and angels. Well, if when he disappeared, it was because God took him, then he being from earth now in glorified form can speak to angels who associated with women on earth. That's just um, a little practical. Chapter 13, coming to the end. And Enoch went and said, Azazel, thou shalt have no peace. A severe sentence has gone forth against thee to put thee in bonds, 
and thou shalt not have toleration nor request granted to thee because of the unrighteousness which thou hast taught and because of all the works of godlessness and unrighteousness and sin which thou hast shown to men then i went and spoke to them all together and they were all afraid and fear and trembling seized them and they besought me to draw up a petition for them that they might find forgiveness and to read their petition in the presence of the Lord of heaven. Very interesting that Enoch is used to ask for forgiveness knowing they have messed up. Chapter 14, final chapter we will read. The book of the words of righteousness and of the rip and of the reprimand of the eternal watches in accordance with the command of the holy great one in that vision i saw in my sleep what i will now say with a tongue of flesh and with the breath of my mouth which the great one has given to me to converse therewith and understand with the heart as he has created and given to man the power of understanding the word of wisdom so have he created me also and given me the power of reprimanding the watchers, the children of heaven. I wrote out your petition, and in my vision it appeared thus, that your petition will not be granted unto you throughout all the days of eternity, and that judgment has been finally passed upon you. Yea, your petition will not be granted unto you. I will pause here. Now as you can see, lots of the information is startling, but corresponds to scrolls in the Bible that we have accepted. It begs the question, do we condemn the book of Enoch or do we consider it as a great explainer of what is in other books of the compilation called the Bible? So what is the conclusion of this study? Well, let me say it was an eye opener for me not having ever read the book of Enoch before, coming from the tradition that any book that is not in the Protestant Bible is devilish and forbidden. I had never even ventured but having done so today has opened my eyes that we should not just condemn a thing before understanding it. So by way of conclusion, I will repeat this. The Bible is not a book sent from heaven, so everything outside of it is forbidden. There are many scrolls and books written by many spiritual people, and let us hold on to our salvation, which is simply that Jesus died for our sins. And then according to Paul, dig deeper and learn from all that was written. Let us learn from them. Wisdom will tell us what to reject and what to accept. But so far, the book of Enoch does not come over as a book to be afraid of. So let's explore it further. And as usual, keep trusting and holding onto your faith in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Dear God, we know that there is so much out there that we cannot digest at once. Help us to focus on what is important and learn about that which can benefit our knowledge. Teach us to number our days and live our lives with wisdom. Bless us as we continue to live for you, we pray. For we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thanks again for watching. If you have been blessed or enlightened, feel free to leave a comment. You can also like, click the button, the like button to say that this was beneficial to you. If you have not yet subscribed, why not do so? And share these studies so that your friends and families can benefit from more learning. And always remember that the Word of God is full of wisdom. It's objective, it's resourceful, and it's definitive. Let's keep studying.